Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Shanker, Editor-in-Chief of The Innovator, a global magazine about digital transformation. And I'm very happy to be here uh, today with a super panel to discuss uh, uh, the rise of the dataocracy. History is replete with uh, examples of over-reliance on metrics, which have led to unfortunate outcomes. Today, we are relying more and more on big data and algorithms um, for our decision making um, to solve big problems, to evaluate people, um, and predict outcomes. You could almost say that um, big data and algorithms uh, have become a, a kind of religion. Um, and so today, we're going to ask the question, is our faith in its accuracy well-founded. Um, and to discuss this issue, we have with us here today Igor um, Tulshininsky, uh, who is uh, the head of a $5 billion hedge fund uh, called WorldQuant that uh, uses algorithms uh, to predict outcomes. Um, we have Yu Yang, who is the um, founder of a company called uh, Yeesites, um, which um, was a world-leading uh, cross-language big data analysis platform. Uh, we have Frida Pauli, who uh, is a award-winning Harvard and MIT-trained neuroscientist turned CEO. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Hilary Cottom, who is a social entrepreneur and the author of a book called Radical Help. So I'd now like to get right into our discussion um, and start by asking our panelists, what are the new opportunities that um, advanced technology uh, uh, allows? Um, and uh, um, I'll start off with you, Igor. Tell us a little bit about how you are applying algorithms and how this can help society. Yes, uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, WorldQuant Asset Management is, a, is an asset management firm. We're quantitative. Uh, we're global uh, in the 20, uh, 27 offices in 16 different countries. But uh, what makes us unique is the fact that we have about 19 million algorithms that we use to predict security prices. So uh, I wouldn't call this world a dataocracy. I would call it an algorithmocracy because data is growing exponentially. And you know, anything that grows exponentially becomes uh, commoditized. So it's really the algorithms uh, that derive the meaning uh, from this data. So uh, let me give you some examples of something uh, that we've been doing uh, outside of uh, our main business. We have a joint venture with Weill Cornell Medical Center. It's called the World Quant Center for Predictive uh, Medicine. And uh, one of the things we did, I think everybody in the audience knows somebody who has, uh, was uh, unable to have kids easily, so they go to uh, in vitro fertilization. And that's a very... Uh, heartbreaking process sometimes because you cannot tell easily which uh, embryos are, are viable. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have developed uh, an algorithm together with a wild Cornell which uh, can uh, pinpoint with 90% accuracy the viability of embryos by looking at the image of the embryo. So that's, that's one example. Another example, uh, I'm sure everybody in the room has heard of an astronaut twin studies where the idea is uh, we, you know, everybody wants to uh, space travel, but uh, it's important to see what happens to uh, humans uh, in space, in particular, what happens to human genome in space. So one uh, twin was left on Earth, one twin was uh, sent into space for a year, a ton of data was collected, and uh, we've developed uh, an algorithm that'll predict what happens uh, to a human genome uh, as a, you know, when, when you send it to space, basically. So these are three examples. 
Okay, so um, Yuyan, let's uh, let's talk about um, how uh, you've been applying um, algorithms. You've also worked in the medical field, right. and um, you're also applying them to fake news. So let's let's hear about that. All right. Uh, actually, uh, GDCom is a company uh, getting involved in like a bit of everything. Uh, the big data, some machine translations, and also speech recognition and uh, image recognition. But when we talk about the big data, what I mean the big data is uh, it's not just simply like a, because GDCom is a Chinese company, but we are not mentioning just the Chinese uh, data. And what, what we mean is the multilingual data. When we put in the search engine, if we put a keyword Apple in the Google, you're about to find out the, all the, the, the news or data information in English. But it's supposed to be have uh, the data English, Chinese, Russian, German, I mean, everything. That what we mean, the multilingual text, and also the content of the audios, and also the content of the images. And we try to leverage in the machine learning NLPs to calculate those three different types of the like a format of the data. And also, what is the most important, uh, we, we just would like to propose a new concept, like a, when we talk about data, when you talk about news, for example, mm -hmm. we think it's only three st status. And uh, the first one is the data, second one is alternative, alternative data, third one is the mirror data. And that could be no fake news. What I mean is that if there is a no truth standing out, and the fake news could be there for real, for one month, for one year, or even for 10 years, so we try to calculate the, the three status of the different, uh, the three data of data and to try to find out the, the balance and try to tell uh, uh, let the people to make the judge judgment. And also we have a, a, a company uh, in, who uh, focus on the uh, medical imaging areas mm -hmm. called the Paradox. And, uh, as we all know, China enjoys the largest population in the world. And the Chinese people one year need to have like a 1.3 billion a city could scan. But we, uh, clearly, here in China, we still haven't got the sufficient qualified doctors to review those, those uh, CT scans. So we try to let the machine to learn the, the medical images. Mm -hmm. Right now, the paradox are able to diagnose the lung cancer, liver cancer, brain tumor, and uh, pathological analysis. Uh, take the lung cancer as an example. The machine already learned like 100,000 confirmed patient cases. And each patient actually have a 200 to 400 uh, CT images. That means the cities, uh, that the machine already learned that much, uh, that many images. For uh, doctors, when they graduate from a medical school, uh, for whole his, uh, his whole career, life, a doctor only can see like uh, 2,000 patients. Mm -hmm. But the machine already learned like uh, 100,000 confirmed lung cancers. So, so clearly, um, algorithms are helping us solve um, some huge problems. But there's some, uh, there can be some downsides to this. And, and one of them is bias, because uh, we are training um, algorithms, uh, quite often with historical data, and um, that means biases can be baked in. Um, so I want to turn to Hillary because her company has actually invented a technology that audits algorithms to ensure there is not any bias. So Hillary, tell us a little bit about that. Sure, happy to. Um, so Pymetrics is a company that uses artificial intelligence and behavioral science to help in the recruiting process, recruiting and other uh, human capital processes. And I would actually argue that, you know, Machine learning is, like any other technology, neutral. It's really up to us and how we deploy that technology that makes the difference. It's just like any other technology in the world, genetics. All these technologies can be used either to advance causes that we believe in or actually bring us backwards, right? 
And so if you think about current hiring processes, um, there are lots of ways in which humans introduce bias into that process, right? And so when we speak about algorithms using bias training sets, those bias training sets often were created by humans, right? Of course. So I think that this juxtaposition of biased algorithms versus you know, the straw man of unbiased humans is just a straw man or a straw sure. woman. Sure. So I think that actually there's great potential for machine learning and algorithms to reduce bias. They can augment bias if we're not careful, but they can also reduce bias because a human, all of us here are all biased. There's no way to make sure that Igor or you is unbiased. There's just no test for that. Whereas you can actually audit algorithms, right? And that's what Pymetrics does is we've created a technology called Audit AI that essentially looks at the output of any recruiting algorithm that we build and ensures that from a statistical perspective, there are no biases with respect to gender and with respect to ethnicity. Those are the two biases that people care about the most in terms of hiring. Um, and this process that we've developed can really be applied to any algorithmic process. And so we've open sourced it on GitHub. But I guess the broader point that I'd like to make is that I think unlike humans, we can develop technologies that will audit algorithms. And as a result, I think it can actually be a powerful tool for reducing bias. That having been said, I think untested or unaudited algorithms can and will often lead to increased bias. So again, it's really about the design of the algorithms and the humans that are creating these technologies and how they choose to both design and then implement them that really will determine whether something is a biased technology or not. That's kind of our position. As a, as a follow-up, um, one of the things I find interesting about your technology is it, it is supposed to also be able to identify high potential um, individuals who may have been overlooked. So, mm -hmm. how do you how do you train an algorithm to look for high potential, and you know how yeah, do you so even define high potential? That's a great. I was just going to say that. So, I think historically we've thought of high potential as being a thing that you could say across the board is universal. We actually don't believe that. I think to be a high potential uh, person in a certain sphere may be very different than being a high potential person in a different sphere. So we actually work with companies and we create custom algorithms using their own employee base to identify what high potential means in a particular context. So again, it's much less about creating a world where certain people have high potential and others don't. It's really identifying what area of life, what area of career will you have, will you demonstrate high potential in and matching you to that high potential field. And I think that the reason that we're able to identify it in you know, people that previously have been overlooked is because we're not relying on um, markers that are often tied to socioeconomic status, you know, where you went to school. Other things like that are often a pedigree that's associated, with, unfortunately, oftentimes with socioeconomic status. So we try to remove that. Um, from the process and in, in, and in doing that really allow for a broader set of individuals, a much broader set to be matched to opportunities where their ability to have high potential will be maximized. Thank you. So now I'd like to turn to Hillary Sower. Um, NGOs um, and, and, and socially focused um, organizations um, are becoming under more and more pressure to come up with um, data measurements. Um, and I'd like you to talk about, you know, what are the pluses and minuses of, of this? So I think there is increasingly in my world, in the social world, we're about social change. And there's this increasing emphasis on what works, which I think is a good thing. You know, there's not enough dollars to go around. We need to make sure that we're investing in the right way. But obviously, the business of human change is messy and complex. And so I think that there are a number of challenges with this uh, emphasis on measurement and a kind of belief in certain types of measures. So I think one of the things, for instance, in the social world is that there's been a recent meteoric rise of the randomized control trial, that that is the kind of ultimate gold standard, and money is following the RCT. But that's quite complex. That costs 
around $10 million to do a sort of half-decent mm -hmm. RCT, which is a, almost, it was a sum beyond small organizations. Mm -hmm. And also, these kinds of measures can only measure certain things. So mm -hmm. we see an emphasis on certain kinds of intervention that are very easily measured. Some of these are good. Again, you know, immunization is a good example. Uh, bed nets for malaria. It's not that these things aren't good things, but that we are focusing very strongly on some things that can yield good data. Um, at the exclusion of other things. And as you say, not all organizations can afford to pay for this kind of gold standard. And then I think you know, another challenge is that, uh, with the RCT in particular, is that to get the right kind of measures, you have to have very short term. You know, your data panels have to be very short term to make sure there's not so much variation. And one thing about human change is it's very long term, actually, mm -hmm. and that humans move backwards as well as forwards, and that's kind of part of the complexity. So I think it's interesting to think about what kind of different measures we can have for different contexts and what kind of new measures we might develop for what I would call a kind of complexity paradigm of, of human development. Is there a danger that we can draw wrong conclusions from data around, especially in the, in the social sphere? Um, well, I think uh, the, the actual data itself is often, uh, I mean, so one of the things about human change is that it involves talking about things people don't want to talk about. If I ask you, for instance, are you lonely, you're not going to put in a survey that you're lonely, which is one of the reasons that this kind of global problem was overlooked for so long, because there's no data on it. Nobody's going to confess that they're lonely, but this is a very big problem. On the other side, I think that you know, we could be measuring the wrong things because the, it's very easy to uh, have data around problems that you can manage. But it's very, what actually creates change might be something else. So for instance, relationships are absolutely core to human change, to encouraging people to change, to sustaining change. And of course, relationships are extremely hard to measure. So I think it's more that we're kind of focusing, we don't have data about the things that, that matter. And then the other thing I think is that, well, insight and data is not the same thing, is it? And so again, this goes back to your original question about small organizations. So I think what's important about small organizations is that they should be allowed to be radical, to start pushing forward work. A lot of the measurements we have relate to old paradigms. Here yes. we're talking a lot about the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. The world is changing very fast, and we don't have the right kind of frameworks to measure. So a very good example of that would be health, where we have a lot of data around uh, infectious disease, but not very much around chronic disease. So we begin to kind of sort of have measurement systems that force us to look backwards rather than forwards very often. And I think that that is also a big problem around what we measure. I mean, in my own work, you know, I say that if, if traditionally we kind of work, most social science works in the kind of big part of the bell curve. And I try to work at either extreme, actually, because I think that if we can kind of design things that work for people who are at the, who are at the outliers, then it will work for everybody. But again, that's a data challenge because the data is all about kind of the middle of the bell curve. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, I mean, there was an interesting article in um, the New York Times over the weekend that talked about um, how the U.S. should uh, introduce new ways of measuring the economy. They said, you know, uh, the, the um, employment statistics and the way we measure GDP were, um, were designed at the end of the 1800s, and they don't necessarily reflect the, um, the reality today. So yes. it might show we have record low unemployment, but it doesn't uh, reflect the fact that you have two parents working, three jobs, they don't have health insurance, yes. and they're living in the shelter because they can't afford rent. Uh, so, um, so for instance, in the UK, we have uh, uh, in work poverty, we have um, between a third and half of British families on benefits because they're paid too low to live on. You know, their wages are too low to live on. They're not falling officially below the poverty line, but of course this creates all kind of social and political effects because people actually don't want to live on handouts. But another good example would be that in most countries in the world, it's illegal to die of aging. You have to be put into a category of some form of disease. And of course this totally defines how we look at older people, that you are a body part to be managed, not a human being to be taken care of. And increasingly we're seeing both the kind of social, cultural, and financial implications of that kind of categorization. So I think we see it in the economy, we see it socially, we see it everywhere, actually. So let's examine some, some of the other dangers um, ab about over-reliance on data. And, and here, Eric, I'd like you to talk about um, the, the, um, the, the global risk study. Yeah, as, uh, uh, as we all know, the World uh, Economic Forum every year will release a, a report called the Global Risk Report. And for last year, in 2017, it's a 13 years report. And actually this year, we just uh, 
based upon the, the big data, and uh, we generate uh, new reports for, for the global risk report. And uh, uh, the original report actually mirrored the five key categories. And uh, th uh, there, uh, there, there were uh, like uh, 30 subcategories. And the five key uh, categories is the politics, uh, geopolitics, the environment, uh, what else, uh, energies, and, and uh, th uh, those different categories. And we actually leverage like uh, eight million of uh, data, global data, mm -hmm. and the C data. And we uh, take advantage of the machine learning to learn those C data. And finally, we actually use like uh, 30 million of data, global data, to measure those uh, like uh, uh, categories. And then we find out seven major differences from the original global risk report. So yeah. same data set, but seven major They're different actually, conclusions? The, the, the original global risk report uh, uh, released by the WEF is uh, based upon the human interviews. So every, every year, uh, WEF will organize like uh, 700 uh, uh, experts, uh, scholars from different, different areas and to send out, uh, to send out the uh, interviews and, and uh, to, to investigate those are five major categories and 30 subcategories to, to, to have the feedback and to generate that overall re, uh, report. But we leverage the, the big data. And uh, what, what I, I mean is, is data from China, English, uh, uh, the, the states, uh, it's a global data, the multilingual data. And the two, we, we, we let the machines learn the data, so for example, when, when we talk about the extreme red weathers, mm -hmm. and how people measured about the terrorist attack, and also the uncontrollable uh, inflation. And we find out that the five major differences, and uh, which is uh, totally different from the scholar's opinion. So I, I think because uh, another example, uh, we all know that each year uh, um, a consulting company is uh, will release the hyper circle for the new technologies, for the new emerging technologies. And uh, those, like a uh, hyper circle, is always the same for the past uh, 20 years. That based upon the experts' opinions. They said, well, this year, the blockchain is supposed to be there. And uh, the drones is going to be there. But that all based upon the human's uh, uh, judgment. Mm -hmm. But let's say, what if we are able to measure all the data seen in the past 20 years, and how many people are talking about the drones in the past 10 years, and how many patents, how many companies, how, what is the scale of the market share, and how many new products emerging in that market. And actually nowadays, because 10 years ago, apparently, we, we, are unable to, we were unable to measure those data. We yeah. don't know where. But nowadays, we are able to gather those data. And we are able to measure those data. And also, the data are able to be uh, uh, used in the, to, uh, in the FinTech. For example, like we have the market psychology. And we measure uh, like the market uh, uh, sentiment mm -hmm. to, to, like, uh, to, to project the, the, market, uh, the crude oil price and also the, uh, the, 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 the share price. So that's very much what you are doing as well. So t maybe talk a little bit about how reliable you feel the algorithms are and how you are relying on the, them to make predictions and, and then investing accordingly. Yes, well, there is a reason why we have 19 million algorithms. And the reason is you want to maximize diversification because any individual algorithm is going to have a bias. Any individual algorithm will have its flaws. But uh, different algorithms are put together by different people. Different people have different biases. So by the time mm -hmm. you mix it all up and, you know, uh, and, and look at all of them in the aggregate, mm -hmm. the biases get small and the signal gets large. So this is, this is how we deal with it, extreme diversification. OK. So um, 
let's talk um, about um, how a focus on um, metrics can distort outcomes sometimes. Um, Hillary, you have a point of view on that? Um, yes, I mean, I'm concerned with the day, way that uh, data can sort of lead to sort of different outcomes. I'm, I'm more concerned really with, with the way that certain data leads to certain kinds of programs and actions, um, which, which then of course lead to different uh, so, for instance, one of the things, um, uh, I, I can give some examples. So, for instance, in Pittsburgh, there's, um, there's a, a data system which has 131 points that decides, for instance, how you will behave with your children and whether you're likely to abuse your children or not. So that's, you know, what you can't see in that data set is what kind of changes people are already making in their lives, what kind of broader relationships they might have around them. So this would be a very good example where you can use data to try and target families that might be in, in need. But what you get out of that is you get, um, you get a data set at risk, but you get no knowledge of how you might actually then move in to support those families and what are the kind of good, productive things that might be happening in order to, in order to, to, to make that kind of change. So I think that that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm concerned about. And I mean, one of the things that I've been doing is trying to develop uh, different forms of metric around people's capabilities that are both measuring kind of external and internal capability so that we can begin to kind of count different things that matter, such as relationships, which I've mentioned before, because we can see definitely in good longitudinal databases that the strength of your relationships is highly determinant of your life, but generally those are things that are very difficult to measure. And when, if you don't measure it, it doesn't have attention, and then you don't act on it, basically. Mm. Did you want to add to that? I mean, I, I would agree. I think that if you have an incomplete data set, which is really what you're describing, um, then your algorithms or any kind of conclusions you draw are going to be less powerful. I think that's just a kind of basic fact of measurement is that if it's only half of the relevant data that you need, you won't get a complete picture. So and I would so, agree with that. I mean, and I think this is a good segue into um, uh, the broader topic of um, we are people are being measured um, every aspect. We, we now have algorithmic twins, uh, if you will. And, and so everything we do is being, uh, is being measured in one way or another. And there's been a lot of talk um, in the press about the Chinese social scoring system, um, where people are rated on their civicness and, um, and there are, are major consequences um, uh, about you know where you can apply for a job or if you can have a passport and so forth. Um, but what I think has been left out of that conversation is that we have uh, many similar type measurements in the West that are non-transparent. People mm -hmm. are scored on their um, financial um, uh, responsibility, they are scored um, by recruiters on the way they behave in social media. Um, there are many, many different ways that we are being measured and they're not transparent. We have no control over them. We don't know who's collecting data about us, um, uh, what they're doing with it. And if God forbid there's a mistake made, uh, we have no way of correcting it. So I think it's interesting to discuss as a society, as a global society, how do we confront this? Um, how do we set some sort of, um, of uh, rules or oversight um, in place uh, to make sure that uh, there is some transparency and some control? Um, who wants to take that on? Well, I mean, one thing I would say is that, you know, data is like a kind of modern form of mining, isn't it? I mean, it's highly extractive, and it's not just the sort of, uh, sort of bigger governmental systems you're talking about and the credit rating data and all of that that we also have in the West. It's also that in social programs, um, you are asked to give up a lot of your time and your data so that you can be measured, but you don't own your data. It's exactly the same as at the macro level. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we could talk about is, you know, how this process becomes less extractive, how you own your own data, where whether it is kind of credit data or whether it's data, you know, um, in the kind of work I do, which is data around how your health is improving or data around how your children are doing well, data that's meaningful to you 
and you can actually learn from by owning it. So in my world, kind of owning your own data not only is kind of empowering, but it actually means that you learn rather than the people with the clipboards who came to interview mm -hmm. you learn, and then that kind of promotes sort of exponential kind of social change, which I think is really important. Yeah. I would say something in addition to that. I have two things I would say in addition to that. One is that um, you know in the West there is generally a a little bit of a bifurcation of data that you've put out there in the public domain, mm -hmm. right? Like your Twitter feed or whatever it is that a recruiter may or may not be using. And again, I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying you have put it out in the public domain versus, you know, your health information, which is, you know, highly protected by a lot of regulation, right? So there is that difference. Um, and so we should just be mindful of what we're talking about when we talk about data, right? Because that could mean a lot of different things. Um, and then secondly, I think that, you know, again, this, this kind of gets into where um, political uh, institutions intersect with um, thoughts around what you do with data, right? I mean, in the EU, all of the GDPR and data privacy laws that have come into effect really are a response to this idea that data should be owned by the individual. And, you know, as we all know, there have been a lot of changes that technology companies, small like Pymetrics, large like Google, have had to make as a result of that, right? So, again, I think people are responding to these challenges in different ways. And I think it does reflect the political climate of different geographies and, and sort of not just political, but the social norms of different countries. And I think it kind of remains to be seen, I think, where this all nets out, I think. Do you, do you want to add to that, Eric? Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, I think uh, we need a bit more time in the perspective of uh, the data artificial intelligence and the big data need a bit of time. And the companies or enterprises need more time. And also the government need a bit of time. Because that, that, that could be a kind of the joint efforts. Mm -hmm. Especially because as we all know that artificial intelligence is booming, it could be like last three to five years. And when we talk a real big data, say it's maybe in the past five years. And due to the, the chipset and the memories and the uh, calculating computing capabilities, but those are the new emerging uh, problems, especially for the GDPR released by the European uh, unions. But I think, the, for example, like like uh, the, the the government need to to have a role, uh, like a management toward the data privacy, especially mm -hmm. just now I mentioned uh, like uh, the uh, medical imaging, uh, the healthcare data, and also like uh, the news, uh, social media, the same. And for the company, and uh, the companies that like need to have a uh, common consensus on the, uh, the like uh, data privacy protections, and also need a bit of joint efforts to monitoring the whole process. And also, that need to be a like a like a, the mechanism to coordinate. Because I, I think it all comes back to what Hillary said earlier about you know it depends on how the technology is used, right? So I don't know how many of you have noticed, but across the hall um, there's a demonstration of voice recognition technology um, that um, uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University is working on, and um, the the voice recognition technology. Uh, could play an important uh, beneficial role um, in the sense that it can detect from your voice certain health issues. And so the idea is that you could use this voice recognition technology um, along with telemedicine to, um, to give people early alerts about medical conditions and potentially save lives. But if this was used in a different way, um, I mean, I don't know how many of you have done it. I, I, I tested it myself this afternoon. But you stand in front of, of, of this machine, and they, they have you uh, read like a paragraph. And then immediately afterwards, within seconds, it tells you um, about what you look like, um, guesses your age, um, can measure different things about your health, um, about your mental state. Um, at the moment, um, about your personality, whether you have leadership uh, potential in, in a job. So you could imagine this being used um, in 
different um, circumstances, maybe for recruitment or something else, um, that could be slightly disturbing. Um, and especially since, um, at least for now, um, the, the, the technology is, is not quite ready for, for prime time. And I, I can attest to that because it told me that I was um, a man, that I'm 20 years younger than I am, that I'm very tall and, um, and, and big bones. So, um, uh, so there, you know, as, as much faith as we put in technology and as, as, as wonderful as some of the predictions now are on, on, on global risks or um, things that might impact the economy, um, we, we aren't quite, quite there with all the different technologies yet. And there are, there are some things that we have to pay attention to, some dangers. So that, I think, is a good segue into in the next question, which is, to what extent do the panelists believe that we must marry human judgment with, um, with uh, the technology um, in order to have the right context and the best outcomes? I, mean, I think you all, uh, certainly that is always going to, I shouldn't say always, for the foreseeable future is going to be the case, right? I mean, a lot of what we're talking about here is not general artificial intelligence, it's narrow artificial intelligence, which will always be applied by a human for a specific use case, and usually in combination with some form of human judgment. Now, when general artificial intelligence comes along and, you know, God only knows when that happens or when or what happens when that happens, that's potentially, you know, a world-changing event. But until then, I think these are all narrow specific use cases that will always be deployed with the context of human judgment. That's kind of my take on it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I am very interested in how we develop what I would call a, like a complexity paradigm. I mean, I would say that, you know, the algorithm is a Newtonian paradigm, which is great when things are, you know, objectifiable, linear, but human change is not. But then the flip side of that, and the reason that, you know, I, for one, am so interested in measurement is that we have to have rigor. Like, we, ha we do have to know what works, and we do have to kind of exclude as much bias as possible. So I think we, we need to kind of balance data with human judgment. And what would be wonderful would be if we could also put as much energy into the kind of sophistication of thinking of what those methods of human judgment are, which, you know, there's some really exciting developments around participatory methods where people kind of cross-check each other, for example, um, ground-truthing where you spend time looking at things from different perspectives. But I think it would be really exciting to develop those kinds of human judgment systems and think about what rigor is in those systems and sit them alongside more quantifiable data systems. I, I think the only other thing I would say is that I think sometimes we really exalt human judgment to be so much better than or somehow you know, impervious to all these problems that we see in algorithms. And I would just argue that there are many examples, and I won't mention any specific ones, but I'm sure we can all think of many examples where human judgment has been extremely flawed, leading to very catastrophic events, right? So I think we just have to be careful when we think about one being, you know, dangerous and potentially the other being a salve to that. Because but do I you think that's because think we're that's sophisticated around humans and we kind of understand bias and we understand cultural judgment and the problem with our kind of sort of almost awe of data because it's so recent is that we, we don't understand how it's culturally embedded mm -hmm. and we don't understand how it's biased enough. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's the problem, isn't it? It's taking that kind of critical perspective now to the data that we might have about human judgment because I, I, I agree I with you. I think it's whenever a new technology comes around, people think it's going to end the world. You know, I mean, so I was a neuroscientist before I became an entrepreneur. And, you know, when brain imaging came around, everyone thought that, oh, my goodness, you're going to scan somebody's brain at birth and be able to, like, predict something about them, and it's going to become this Gattaca-like future. And now the same thing is being thought about with artificial intelligence. So I think, you know, change provokes fear in human beings, which is natural. Um, and we always fear the worst. And then, you know, and, and we also dream that these technologies are going to just create this yes. utopian future. And in the end, it's sort of like a disappointing middle ground where, you know, things get better, but they're not quite as scary as we think they'll be, and they're not quite as awesome as we think they'll be. Well, so, I, think I don't that's know, that's true. my Because I think the last time the kind of data cracks yeah. were powerful was in the last Industrial Revolution, when, again, there was a similar kind of, like, bubble about data, and, you know, sort of encyclopedias and collecting and making lists, and then yeah. people saw the problems, yeah. and, but, yeah, I agree. So. What's your perspective on this? Machines will never, ever displace humans because there is a one primary reason, is that humans and machines are different. 
And anytime you put two different things together, yeah. you get something better. So it's simply uh, not ever going to happen. Yeah. Okay. And, and so how does it work in your firm, the human uh, algorithm balance? You know, we have some uh, algorithms made by humans. We have some algorithms made by machines. We have uh, measures. I, I can say that at this point in time, the algorithms made by humans are about 50 times better than the one made by machines. Okay. But where machines win is on the sheer quantity and the brute force and the, and the breadth of the approach. Uh, you know, m machines are just that, machines. Machines make predictions. Humans make the judgment. As machines uh, bite off a little bit more of what the humans do, the human judgment level yeah. keeps uh, escalating and, and, yeah. and, and going up. And that's a, it, it's a never-ending uh, spiral. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Eric. Yeah, I think it's a, a process of the convergence. And definitely it's a combination of the human efforts and, and the, the machine findings. Uh, I'd like to like, uh, take uh, the machine translation as an example because uh, like uh, 15 years ago, I was a simultaneous interpreter. And right now, we developed the, the machine translation. And uh, in, in different uh, uh, like a conference, I will, say, uh, I will say that definitely nowadays, the machine translation are able to replace the human translator. But at the very beginning, you know, two or three years ago, no one believed it. And even when I when I was t telling the stories in the in the school of the translations, so no one chose to believe it. But the thing is that, as we all know, the Oxford uh, uh, Dictionary only have uh, eighty thousand words. But the machine translation, our machine translation, we have a five billion high quality sent sentence pair. And uh, and also people are will argue that what if uh, we translate the, the, like, like a literature out there? And uh, I'm telling the truth is that what if we put the, the high quality translation versions within the, into the language model out there? Whenever the machine translation came across that paragraph or that article, they generate the, the best one. It's definitely much, much better than any one of the translators out there. So, but the truth is that nowadays the machine translation is not replaced the human translator. Because nowadays the machine translation touched upon, it definitely the data, the information, or so knowledge never ever been touched by human translators. Because nowadays the for machine translation for one second are able to translate like a 16, uh, sorry, uh, 16,000 words for one second. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of imagined by the human efforts. And also, another, uh, another example is that for the, like, uh, the paradox of me medical imaging, the same. Even nowadays, the, uh, the uh, medical imaging diagnosis system are able to reach like 99.2% accuracy, but only like 1% like mistakes could not be tolerated in any circumstances. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely the combination. Okay. The human doctor. So even nowadays, the human doctor's accuracy is only like an average one accuracy is like a 70% globally. But definitely is a combination. For okay. the what do people in the audience think about this? Um, what are some of your concerns? What would you like to ask the panelists? Who wants to start? Over here. I'm, um, I'm from Argentina. My name is Lourdes. I, I run a translation startup. So I'm, I'm, we are moving. No, it's fine. And we are moving into uh, using the data that we have as translators uh, have aligned all these uh, phrases into using that information to position companies abroad because of the use of their own technical language and technical keywords that we are able to identify in different uh, texts um, and about that uh, combination of human uh, and machine I think that about the data that we are talking about a lot about 
uh, the amount of data, but not the quality of the data. And it's really important to understand that supervision uh, on machine learning uh, for us worked very, very well. And uh, um, I don't understand why it's not being used much more. W what is your, your take on this? I, I remember Mechanical Turk having huge crowdsources of, of people um, out outsourcing uh, the, the supervision of, of uh, the results of the machine. And I think that should be uh, used a little bit more to make it faster. I mean, we didn't have enough data, and with the supervised information, we achieved a, a quality of, of results that we were not going to be able uh, to achieve with, uh, with the amount of clients or, or, or uh, volume that we managed. What do you think about that? Yeah. Actually, nowadays, when we talk about the big data, the big data is, a, is a, how to say, it, is, is a, is a, the big data has two sides because, uh, like, uh, when I think starting from 2016, the neural machine translation uh, uh, came out, uh, came out uh, released by the Google. Uh, previously, it was SMT, statistical machine translation. At that time, the machine tra the language models need to be trained by at least uh, uh, at least 100 million sentence pair. But now nowadays. With the help of the neural machine translation, in order to change, achieve the same quality of the uh, translation quality of the machine, <coughs> machine translation engines, only 10 million systems, high quality sentence pairs is sufficient. So, so I, I think it's a, uh, it's, a it's definitely the, the balance, yes. the high quality, high quality of a data set, no matter the language uh, corpus or the medical images. And the same, at the same time, the, the algorithm. And, uh, algorithm. and uh, before the algorithm, mm -hmm. and we need the human doctors, or uh, I, mean, uh, I mean the human expert, to set up the golden rules. For example, like uh, medical Im images. And we definitely need the human doctors, experts, to, to tell them the golden rules to diagnose lung cancer. And uh, then we ask the doctors to tag each piece of the images out there and tell them the, the symptoms of those images. But on the other, side, uh, on the other hand, the, the machine definitely have uh, the absolute advantages compared to the human, human sure. beings. Sure, absolutely. Viola, I hear you, see you shaking your head. What do you want to, uh, to say? And please introduce yourself. Sure. Good job, Jennifer. And um, my name is Viola Llewellyn. I'm the co-founder of Avamba Solutions, so a fintech platform that was created for African realities. We're one of the few companies in the world that has decided against some Western sentiments to involve tribal data into our risk models and built an algorithm to lend money to African SMEs. My uh, comment and concern is that at the beginning, your comment about the reliance on big data. Um, puts us in a very strange twilight whereby some Western investors who use data predominantly to make decisions challenge the fact that where we exist with no credit uh, databases in, in much of sub-Saharan Africa, we've actually had to take the time to send human beings to walk around to speak to different types of people in order to collect information to turn into data using A-B testing, machine learning, algorithms, and testing it with our own uh, internal funding and have produced results that are quite indicative of what will we think is the next way in which to fund African SMEs. Do you ever run into these situations where the emerging markets have to use totally different approaches that are not classic by Western standards? And how do you provide the same respect for the veracity of that data and the way it's being used, which is very different to what we see in other places? Great question. Hillary or, or um, which Hillary? Frida. <laughs> I, I actually, we don't work um, much in that geography, so I, I'll turn it over to yes, anyone I that mean, does I, have I, experience. I, I don't have that experience in Africa, but I would say that, I, that a similar experience would be like, um, 10 years ago saying that we should work on an issue like loneliness where there's no data but where you see by spending a lot of time living alongside people or knowing a community that this is a kind of huge issue that somehow isn't showing up in the, in the data. Um, another issue that I've worked with is in Latin America where uh, children are not registering for school 
and this is perceived to be a problem of that they can't afford school uniform or that there's, there's no school meals and actually it's an issue of shame because you don't want to register your children if they're illegitimate, they don't have an identity card and they can't go to school. So I think socially I see, and I think this is a kind of huge issue and ultimately, although you can collect different data, which is what we do, it is then a job of politically lobbying to try and get this on the agenda to collect data in a traditional way around the, around the subject matter. But I think it's a very big issue. The, the lack of data and also um, from what I've read, um, there's also cases of skewing of data in, um, in, in um, emerging markets where um, governments will release um, misleading or even erroneous um, uh, information, and then that is cited as gospel by everyone else, and um, and, and that's a big problem too. So um, over here. there would be a lot of good before the bad, but do you see any scenario in the next five to 10 years where this divide that we see, both social and economic, is actually gonna reduce? Because, I mean, I, I keep worrying. I mean, as human beings, first we outsource the memory part to technology, then we outsource the processing power, and now we're outsourcing the decision-making power. So it kind of begs the question, what's the relevance of humanity? And, and, and if technology has taught us anything, it multiplies faster than we can predict. Right? I mean, in terms of everything. It's getting faster, it's getting smaller, it's getting cheaper. So none of us in this room can actually predict how fast AI is going to be, you know, evolved or embraced or anything like that. So Amazon, trillion dollar. Apple, trillion dollar. Like, any country you can see, the divide is just becoming wider. So do you foresee any scenario that this divide is going to get smaller and the benefits of technology are actually going to reach more people than it is currently? Just curious. Would you like to take that? Either? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, you know, I, I, I've heard this point uh, a, a number of times, but uh, in our company, we have been automating, we, we automate things uh, night and day, and there's been no job reduction. As a matter of fact, uh, as you plot the headcount versus uh, what we can do with, with, with time, it just keeps uh, growing and growing. So. Uh, Automation begets, automation begets more algorithms, begets more people, and it's just the things that we need to do keep rising to the next level, and it's a, a level that we can't often, often foresee at, at a given point in time. I, 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 I will uh, get to you in just one second. I just, uh, I think that your question is a very important one because um, if I can just add to Igor's comments, if we look at, what algorithms can do to help improve health, uh, the kind of thing that you're doing. Yeah. And we get closer to precision medicine where we can really um, you know, treat uh, disease in, in a super effective way. We as a society will then have to ask the question, well, how, how are we gonna pay for this? Is this going to be available to everyone? And that's a question that, ha that will have to be addressed seriously. How do we make sure the benefits of this technology are distributed evenly? And that is not clear today. Um, yes, over here. Uh, thanks. Um, I actually wanted to uh, speak to the previous question and then ask a question, because I had a question before, mm -hmm. too. But actually, I am working in the area of inequality, and I did want to say, actually, you're wrong that it isn't in every single country getting bigger. Globally, inequality has been reducing dramatically, and that's not only because of the success of China and of India, but in Africa, too, most countries, not all, but most of the countries, the inequality is reducing, and it is because of technology. It is because mobile phones, mostly, a little bit of the AI, but just getting the ICT out to the people and the incredible innovative things that are happening. So extreme poverty has radically reduced. I mean, there are still some people in extreme, radical, in extreme poverty, but it's like 90 percent reduced. It's amazing what's been done in the last 15 years, and there's a great credit to the developing world there. Um, so I, it's not all gloom and doom, although I agree, and I also am working on the very high inequality in the OECD mm -hmm. is a problem, and it leads to great instability on the global level, so I agree with that. However, that's not the question I was going to ask. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, um, when I, it was a little bit of the earlier discussion about data, and I'm not an expert in data. I know something about algorithms, though, and I know that one of the 
uh, the famous uh, bias cases, um, which is supposedly based on data, which is about recidivism in America, mm -hmm. yeah. no academic can do as bad as the commercial program that, these, that the courts were using. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you have to say, yeah. what were these guys doing, and were they even really using data? And so when you talk about the, the correct use and misuse of data, it seems to me that accountability is a big part. How do we even yeah. know if they're using the data they say, they, they say they're using? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that there's increasing awareness of the issue of bias in data. I mean, Kathy O'Neill wrote the book, Weapons of Mass Destruction. I agree, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that the first thing we need is awareness of bias, right, in whatever algorithm you're using, right? Um, whether it's in the data or somehow the instantiation of the algorithm. And then I think beyond that, there are conversations around creating some sort of, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be an ethics committee or if it's going to be some sort of, you know, I, I don't really know, but there's talk in the air of should there be, will there be some sort of a entity that looks at these types of issues. Now, I'm not sure that's going to happen, if there will be the will to make that happen, or if it will be sort of a self-regulated um, situation. But I certainly think that, at a bare minimum, the awareness on the topic is, I think, at an all-time high and continuing to increase. And I think that that's a, a step in the right direction. That's all that I would say. So. And uh, I mean, since the question had to do with recidivism, you, you and I were talking last night, and you were ta you were giving a great example of yeah. how data can actually um, aid in in, um, in making the case yeah. for um, uh, great social projects. And yeah. I, I think that would be a good yeah. Thing so I was to talking add. about this. I think it's called the Bail Project. If anyone's ever heard of it, it was started by a um, public defender in Brooklyn and her husband, who basically put together a ten thousand dollars slush fund to essentially pay for people's bail because they realized that you know even if you didn't have five hundred dollars bail, you would essentially stay in jail for a week or however many days, and you would you know lose your kids potentially, lose your job, a bunch of different things, right? And so what they did was they amassed all this data around if you actually just loaned people the money, what would happen, right? So the repayment of these loans, right, which you didn't have to repay them, you could have just gotten out of jail and then, you know, gone off, was 96%, right? People were skeptical that it would reach any high number. It was 96%. And then the most shocking thing was that if you didn't have money to pay your bail, I think the, um, the rate at which you had a criminal record was like 88% or 90%, right? Because people just pleaded to whatever it was just to get out of jail so they could go back to their job and their kids and everything else. If you gave them money to get out, um, the rate of, of getting charged with a crime was like 2%. I mean, and again, this was a subset, I'm sure, of all of the people that were out, you know, that were in there on bail. It wasn't, you know, probably the most heinous offenders. I'm sure it was like riding your bike on a sidewalk or whatever it was, right? But it just speaks to, again, it's just how humans use data. That was obviously an example of somebody who had amassed a great data set to show the power of a very simple intervention around providing a free loan to get out of, to, to pay your bail. And it was the data so. that made the, made right. the, the story yep. more compelling. Yep. Um, so. Um, we get, we can take one really quick question because then we can have to wrap up. Yeah, Luke. Well, actually, uh, uh, actually, my question would be read, uh, for the fintech area, for the, especially the data from China, and because my company is a fint I'm running a fintech company for the quantitative trading system provider to the financial institutions in China, especially for the to the work quant and founder. And I just wanted to know because for the financial data and especially for the work quant, we've been overwide like for the uh, worldwide for the investment, but for the Chinese data besides the market data and uh, what do you think about the Chinese data provider? Like, is that, uh, are, are those like Chinese data provider, for example, Wind, which is the official data provider, are they sufficient for you to make the investment decision? Because like, uh, we, well, I used to, in the overseas investment banking, we, we create this company for like a facility for Chinese institutions, but we, what we realized, the data, 
the standard of the data and it's not as good as the overseas, I would say, the European or US standard. And it will affect the investment decisions, especially for the quant, uh, for algo trading system. So this is for address like uh, what kind of data you will use. To that, yeah. we, then we have to wrap up the panel. Yeah, yeah. I, right. I would say that there is a hierarchy in, in the quality of data. The best quality of data for now tends to be in the US and then it goes goes down from there. And that's just uh, the way it's uh, been structurally for historical reasons and, and so on. Uh, we are getting uh, more and more data in China, but uh, it's, it's a difficult process because the contracts have to be in, in, in Chinese and uh, there are a lot of uh, business and legal uh, hurdles to getting it. Thank you. I think we've, we've done a good job talking about the power of big data, but also some of the questions uh, that need to be addressed. And I did want to mention before we, we finish that the World Economic Forum is uh, creating a Global Futures Council on new metrics, which will be launched in November. Um, and uh, so the conversation um, is sure to continue. Um, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists and also the audience for participating. Thank you very much.